Welcome to Rockefeller's Barbershop. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will be blessed and be glad in Him. Today I want to introduce myself. My name is Rico Rodriguez at Rockefeller's Barbershop here in San Antonio, Texas, 1733 Babcock Road. My phone number is 210-782-5188. Come out and get your haircut here at Rockefeller's Barbershop. You are listening to I Am Refocused Podcast on iHeartRadio. You are listening to I Am Refocus Podcast with your host, Shamaya Reed. This podcast is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. Now, let's tune in into today's podcast. Hey guys, this is I Am Refocus Podcast, and today we have an awesome show. But before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. The main one, Rockefeller's Rico Rodriguez. So if you if you get a haircut in San Antonio or you're on your way to San Antonio soon, stop by by Rockefeller's Barbershop and get your haircut. We also want to thank Mr. Bebe McClinton of All Sports Speed and Conditioning. Go visit his uh, sportsandfitness.net. And also the best donuts in town, Miss Kim from River City Donuts. So today, guys, I want to give a really nice thank you to Mr. Trevor Loudon. He's going to be one of our guests. And if you don't know Trevor Loudon, uh, he is an author, a filmmaker, a public speaker from Christchurch, New Zealand. And for more than 30 years, he has been doing research on the radical left, Marxist, and terrorist movements. And he has been doing a lot of things. And I'm going to let him talk about his background story. But we also have an awesome guest, too, Mr. Lieutenant Colonel Retired Roy Wright. He's married with over 38 years, has three kids, seven grandkids. And, man, his, his resume is super long. <laughs> he has done some amazing things himself. But before we get started, I'd like to just have you guys say hello. How are you guys doing today? Hey, how are you going, Shema? It's great to be here. Great to be here, Enrico. Thanks for having us. This is great. I think I need a haircut. <laughs> I, 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 Man, got a, I got a haircut feeling, two days ago. I would have waited for today. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, get, you get a discount for, for a head like Trevor, don't yeah, you? Yeah, there's not much left. Uh. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it wouldn't take much, but on mine, you're going to have to work overtime. But no, thanks for having us, Shemai. It's great to be here, and uh, thanks for what you're doing for telling people, yes, you know, sir. inspiring people. That's great. Yes, sir. And let, let, let me start with uh, Trevor. So, Trevor, uh, can you please just tell us a little background about your life and how you got to this point? Yeah, look, look I, I, I grew up in New Zealand, you know, which is right in the bottom of the South Pacific. And it's regarded as a very beautiful, um, friendly country. But when I grew up, it also had heaps of government control on everything. You know, the, the, they called it the Albania of the South Pacific because it was just government control, high taxation. And we got all this stuff for free. And we sort of thought that was really cool. But we didn't understand that it was limiting our freedom so much. And uh, I bought into all that. I thought it was wonderful. We got, you know, free dental, free health. I didn't have to pay the 66% taxation. Mm. So I was I was cool with it. But, um, you know, later in life, and, I, and uh, what turned me around was um, in my last... See, I've always had this idea right from when I was a little kid that one day I would be talking to large groups of people about very important things. <laughs> And that and was that, at that, eight years of age. Eight, you nine, said. ten years of age. I mean, what kids so, thinks of that? Yeah, so who does, you know? But, <laughs> but when I came to my final year in high school, I was doing fine arts. I was going to go to art school. Mm-hmm. But I had to do electives, um, you know, English or science or something else as well. So I, I chose economics because I thought, well, I have to understand economics because it's so important in the world. And when I'm going to be talking to people, I need that background. Mm-hmm. That was as you know as vague as it was, and I got I got this economics teacher called Jason McCord, and he was the first teacher I ever heard swear at 
his pupils, <laughs> but but um, he was also the only free market, free enterprise economics teacher in the country, as far as I was, I was concerned. Mm-hmm. And he opened my eyes up to how freedom and free markets and 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 will lead to prosperity and and advancement for mankind. Mm-hmm. And he really changed my viewpoint from the sort of. You know, big government is wonderful outlook to individual liberty, free enterprise, people forging their own identity. He really changed my whole outlook on life, that one teacher. And so that's what really set me on a whole new path. And uh, I got into politics from there. I got into business from there. And eventually I ended up I'm on the speaking tour circuit around America. I've spoken in 48 states. I've addressed more than 400 audiences. And it all came back to a few fateful decisions, you know, and, and meeting the right people at the right time and, and having an inner certainty that I was on a path from a very early age. And education, how was that growing up as far as schooling? Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> our, our education system is all public school. Um, mm-hmm. There was a lot of indoctrination in there, but we didn't understand that at the time. And, and I did very well at school. Uh, I was pretty lazy, I've got to say, because mm-hmm. I could always do hardly any work and always get to the top of the class. You know, I was, mm-hmm. I was always pretty good. But... Um, uh, the education system, I think, looking back now, had a lot, had a lot, it was lacking a lot. It didn't really, um, it was very much a conformist system. We're all part of the big welfare state. We're all cogs in the machine. And it didn't really cover, um, you know, um, push people, it didn't really push people to be individuals. Critical thinking. Mm. Critical thinking. There was a very deep lack of that. And I'll tell you, my, my boy is uh, going through the New Zealand education system now, and this is an example of how slack I think it is, because he was having a little trouble with spelling, and I said to his teacher, well, we need to work on the spelling. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, well, she said, well, we don't really worry about spelling. As long as it's near enough, oh. approximate, it's okay, that's what we worry about. And I wish I had said at the time, but I didn't. I wish I'd said, well, next time you go to a doctor and you get your prescription filled, you won't be really caring about the spelling of that, will you? <laughs> you know, as long as it's near enough. That's right. Yeah, like, be okay. Like Rico's, the, the, the guy sitting in Rico's, eh, that's close enough if you just kind of do a little, <laughs> half little of that, fair. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah I, right. Don't think, I don't think this customer is going to be real happy about yeah. it. Nah, it looks good right now, but yeah. I'm glad Rico uh, is doing that yeah. pretty precisely. So. Well, that's right. You know, this is, man, you know you, 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 you're in business, you've got got to do an excellent job and people will come yeah. back you got to get it just right mm-hmm. and and we and my education system didn't really promote that mm-hmm. you know excellence promotes excellence high standards is a very important part of of um you know getting the most out of your life or living in a free society or or everybody achieving and and that should be set right at the beginning. You know, every child deserves to have that excellent education and, and to give them the standards they need to, um, you know, to aspire for great things. Well, and I sit here and think in terms. Of, imagine you're talking about free, gov- you know, free services and such that are provided. Mm-hmm. Imagine if the government determined what Rico was going to charge for as a barber. Mm-hmm. Imagine if everyone was guaranteed a free haircut. Yeah. But it was only going to be at the rate that we're going to tell you. Wouldn't matter how good or how creative Rico would be about bringing in more customers. Why would they come here versus anywhere else? It's yeah. all free. It doesn't really matter. So suddenly his standards go down. But people start complaining when Rico says, hey, that's, I'm getting. This getting is what I'm free. getting paid. I'm, are yeah. you getting it for free? What are you complaining about? Yeah, there'd be two styles. There'd be a total buzz cut, <laughs> skull, or there'd be a bowl haircut. That'd be it. That's uh, it. Your two styles. That's right. But the price would be controlled, and it's free. Yeah. You know. So why wouldn't everybody? Well, they wouldn't like yeah. it because, you know, it's not. 
It's not correct. It's not what the individual really wants. So suddenly everybody gets to be a conformist. So yeah, you got a perfect economic explanation yeah. of why it's why we don't want that. And real yeah, quick. when you get stuff for free, mm-hmm. and you know, people are pushing for free health care in this country, government run health care, mm-hmm. you got to realize the quality and the choice will not be the same. Yeah. Will not that's even true. be close to being the same. Mm-hmm. And that's what they have to understand. And I can give you some examples in New Zealand of how. That works if you want to talk oh, later, yes. but yeah. I was, I was going to jump in with uh, Roy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your educational growing up. How, how was that experience as a child growing up? Well, you know, it's funny. I I, I always wanted to fly airplanes, and, mm-hmm. and there wasn't a lot of airplane courses growing up, but that was an experience I had from a relative who just took me up in an airplane when I was nine years old, mm-hmm. but I never told anyone. My parents had no idea what an impact that one flight wow. had on me. So school was, you know, almost incidental to me. But there were teachers who, who taught me the life's lessons about being persistent and going after goals and doing things. And that really came through sports because, to me, I, I viewed myself as a sports guy. So if I wanted to excel, I had to go do other kinds of things. So, And there was one particular coach, Wayne Bird, who was really int- instrumental in me realizing – there were limitations. I was. I also wanted to be a first baseman for the Orioles too, and I, wow. and that, I figured I had a better shot at that than becoming learning to be a pilot because I didn't know anyone who who was a pilot. So I had no way of knowing. But I figured you had to be a brain surgeon. Well, obviously, I'm. You can look at me and know I'm not a brain surgeon. And and, I, and here for the last 38 years, I've been flying airplanes. So I've been very blessed by God and others to have people be put in my life at certain points. Like Trevor said, those seminal points that really you make a decision, go left or right. And, and God allowed things to come into my life that as a kindergarten PE teacher, which is what I was growing up in North Carolina when I graduated from college, mm-hmm. you know, to go from there to then flying jet fighters within just a matter of a year um, is still something I pinch myself about. And uh, and that was an opportunity to go into the Air Force when a friend of mine who came home and said, told me that the recruiters were recruiting. And in late 79, I had made a decision to either go back to graduate school to try to get a higher degree to be a teacher, <clears throat> you know, a master's, <clears throat> or go into the Air Force because they were suddenly – you know, looking for for pilots, they were desperate, and obviously, I fit in the desperate category. So, mm-hmm. I applied, and uh, and then was able to excel out of that. In 20 years in the Air Force, have a successful career, marry a wonderful woman who supported me, and then get into my next life, which was being a commercial airline pilot. But that was really altered by. Uh, life's events of working with some nonprofits, and nonprofits have changed my life in terms of giving back. Someone once told me, "You get the most out of life when you help others get what they want out of life." Yeah, that's true. And I just, I found in working with children, the military fallen heroes, with Snowball Express, which is a, a nonprofit I helped get going. Uh, we were reaching out to children from around, and and the, what we were getting back from these kids and from the sponsors and donors far outweighed even the families would just tell us hey nobody's ever done this for our kids bringing them all together once a year for four or five days this is incredible all expenses paid i said it pales in the comparison to to the impact you have on on a life on my life and then that becomes uh, a force multiplier in touching other people's lives. So, you know, the the description in the Bible about having your talents and, you know, yeah. burying it, and I don't want to, well, God doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to use your talents and use them in so many different ways and far more than you can ever, ever imagine. Because, um, so it's, you know, and I've met people like Trevor and so many great patriots working with Snowball Express and with the other things I'm involved with, but we'll talk about that. So, but thanks for having us on. We appreciate Definitely. it. Definitely. And going back to Trevor, today's show is a ping pong match. But <laughs> tell us how, uh, how did you get started to be an author? How did that even take place? Yeah, look, look, I started, I was always very interested in politics and uh, I started writing letters to the editor. Okay, and you got to write 150 words, 
mm-hmm. and you got to make your point really, really succinctly. Mm-hmm. So I would write dozens and dozens of letters, and I got quite famous in Christchurch, New Zealand, for my letters to the editor. <laughs> and to, to the point, my father, who worked in a bank, would always say, "Oh, somebody came in the bank today, and they said, are you Trevor Loudon's dad?" And he would get so embarrassed about it, and you know, because they were pretty controversial. Mm-hmm. But I um, so that honed my craft Mm. and then I um, would start writing longer articles for magazines and then I've now written two 700 page books so but but that discipline you know if you want to be a writer start writing small start writing letters to the editor short stories and learn how to make the most points you can in the fewest words possible mm, nice you know um, that's the art of it you know you, you you give the greatest message in the fewest possible words and if you can hone that skill you're on the way to becoming a writer and who did anyone influence you any writers influence you or a mentor yeah well not so much mentor Tours, but I, I was a big admirer of um, the writings of people like Ayn Rand and um, some of uh, some of the Russian writers too, like uh, Boris Pasternak, the guy who wrote Doctor Zhivago, and uh, some of the Russian poets. I, I'm not a big poetry guy, but I just admired their work and also what was, what was it about their work that made it so inspiring you think? well <laughs> partly it was because they were living this is some of the soviet era writers because they're living in such an era of repression that that you know poetry in those days was the was the way you could communicate that the state couldn't interfere with so people would write poems and they would distribute them round and they would um, have you know little poetry readings there and they, there would be subtle political messages in there and there'd be subtle spiritual messages mm-hmm. because religion was obviously you know suppressed so poetry became the underground art form of that time and so you know there was a lot of passion in it there was a lot of uh, creativity yeah. a lot of creativity but it was expressed in very few words very economically done but there was so much meaning put into a little a, a, a little bit of information you know a, a, a one poem or a, a two page poem so that that also I learned a lot about writing from reading that kind of stuff as well. So I'd read American political writers and Russian poets, mm-hmm. and they were the two. Uh, the politics I learned from America, from the founding fathers, from um, you know, from from the from the great American thinkers, and the the art side of it I learned from those Russian poets. And how did you get into speaking? Because you also dabble into that. Yeah, well. <laughs> dabble. Yeah, I dabble, dabble, yeah. Just a little, yeah. Bit. Just look a little it, bit. Look, it started in New Zealand. I didn't public... I never spoke publicly till about the age of 45, and I was wow. involved in a... Um, I, I, I was involved in a political party in New Zealand that was a very small government, uh, low-tax, individual liberty, um, you know, educational choice type of party. And I got elected to the vice presidency of that party, so I would have to give speeches at conferences and that. And I, I, uh, I did one speech. I wrote it all about the, the values of the apprenticeship system. You know, how that people learn through apprenticeships. It was a great thing to to leave school, work for a hairdresser or a carpenter or an auto mechanic and learn the trade from the bottom up. And I was very enthused about that. And I wrote this speech and it was very funny and it got a lot of reaction and it was the hit of the conference. And I thought, wow, there's a hidden talent here. Mm. And so I did a few speeches like that. But then I, um, I wrote some books on the American political scene and I just used to I get invited to speak about my books and from every conference I'd go to I'd get 10 more invitations and then 10 more invitations and eventually it just snowballed to the point where I was virtually touring full time but it was never a, a plan or intention but it it was fulfillment of that early childhood thing one day I'm going to be speaking speaking to large groups of people about very important things and did you have but that it didn't goal? happen until I was 45 years old did you, you know? have that 
have gold when you was little? Was well, I just it, w- it was a thought in my head, like an intuition. What's my role? What am I going to do in life? I'm going to be talking to large groups of people about very important things. And I remember that when I was 8, 10 years old. Yeah. That was going to be what I did. But it didn't really develop till I was in my 40s. Yeah. You know, so I was sort of wondering, when this, when's this going to happen, you know? Yeah. But it was always there, always there. And just hearing you talk, you obviously were taking action and developing your skills. Mm. Speak to a person who, because we always like hearing different uh, perspectives, speak to the person who might feel like they might be stuck in developing their skills. What's some of the things that you did to overcome challenges? Because it's not like you just snap your fingers and you're speaking everywhere. Yeah, well, that, that's right. You, you have to see, we, we've got two sides of life. We have these inner intuitions or messages. We sort of, uh, this is what we should be doing. This might be a calling. But we have rational faculties as well. And it's one, no good having one without the other. Mm-hmm. You've got to be prepared to do some basic work. You've got to be prepared to um, either educate yourself or go through the appropriate courses. But you, you never, never allow... Um, someone else to dictate your career path for you or your life's inner calling. The key thing is you've got to go, have the courage to go it alone and, and push against the crowd if necessary. And step outside so the box. I think step a lot, outside that, that the really box. Cha- I think that's really one of the biggest, we're the biggest obstacle to our own success. I think. We, we, we are. And if you listen to others all the time, yes, you should take advice of elders. Yes, you should. Um, but if it goes against your innermost convictions, you've got to go with your convictions. So you've got to go with your innermost convictions, but you have to be prepared to discipline yourself and do the work that's required. Like, it's no good trying to be a radio <coughs> presenter if you won't do some voice classes or some diction classes mm-hmm. or if you won't go through a broadcasting course, you know. Mm-hmm. You've got to be prepared to do that stuff. Yeah. But ultimately, you have to be have faith in your own inner convictions and we all have a path in life. It's a matter of whether we have the courage and the conviction to strike out on it. Because many people have great talent, great potential, but they're never prepared to make that little leap of faith Mm -hmm. or that strike out on business for themselves or take out that loan they need to start a business or whatever. And I think think one of the biggest challenges is convincing young people, and even middle-aged folks, is that you're not meeting that goal, then find those who are being successful. It's kind of like what this podcast is. Yeah. People who are listening to this mm-hmm. hopefully are, will be taking away those lessons, but asking people the hard questions, well, what was it, what were the steps you went through? And of course, there's all kinds of self-help books out there, mm-hmm. and, you know, millions of them. But asking people who have been successful, and knowing that may not be your perfect blueprint, but, you know, it... it just like coaching a sport or something like that. It's not because I walk out there and just know. I'm asking people who are experiencing this and finding what will work in my life and applying it and making sure, like Trevor said, discipline. The discipline yeah. to do that. Well, as they say, you know, success is not 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. But, you know, don't look at, at work. Don't look at work as a chore or a bad thing look at work as a joy look at yeah. look at productivity and creativity and making something of yourself as a as a as a pleasure as a joy as a benefit mm-hmm. and then you you go into the work environment like that you'll get promoted pretty fast you'll get people commenting on your attitude mm-hmm. too many people think of work as a problem you know, work is what we are here to do. We are here to produce, to make, to create. We're given hands. We're given a, a, a mind. We're given all these faculties. And there is so much joy in creation. There's so much joy in doing what you believe is right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if you have that attitude, I think it takes the dreariness out of things. And Roy, what are some of the qualities that you took away with your military background 
as far as discipline <clears throat> and leadership. I was just thinking back in my days at undergraduate pilot training, UPT, when we would sit there and, and the instructors would say, okay, this is what we're going to fly tomorrow. Uh, I want you to you know, go back and study this. But these were all words on a piece of paper. You literally had to, and, and the wives will tell you, you know, how stupid we look, but we would set up these little cockpits in, in our rooms, and we would actually, you know, you'd see there and you think, this is before simulators or any of the other kind of stuff. I mean, now it's, it's much easier. But for us, we'd be sitting there and going through your mind and really almost like what golfers say, I visualize what my swing is going to be. I'm visualizing, you know, what order I'm going to be moving the stick or the yoke and, and, and how much – yeah. All of those things, all the things that are going through my head. So that checklist mentality uh, is is what got me to the point. And, and sitting there in hours of, of kind of quiet study, sometimes working in a group, but other times just knowing it was up to me. No one was going to fly that airplane uh, other than me. I mean, the instructor could maybe talk me through it, but at some point you're going to be up there solo. And when you're up there solo, there's no one whispering in your ear, and you're flying around a jet fighter for the first time, and you're thinking, holy cow, three months ago I was a friggin' pedestrian. <laughs> you know, and the government's given me this airplane to fly. So you, you really learn very quickly, and you learn that you're never going to fly a perfect flight. If there's one thing that it taught me is that you're going to make mistakes, and you've got to let that just go by. Wow. You've got to learn from it, but people who dwell on that, if I'm worried about my last landing that you know I crunched it on, then all I'm thinking about is that, and I'm going to crunch the next one, and I'm going to crunch the one. And, and some guys couldn't handle that. Some guys could not put their failures Beyond. behind them, and you have to do that. You have to put that last line. Because I can tell you, when I'm flying passengers now, they don't care what my last landing was like. They want to know that this next one is the one I'm totally focused on. And if I'm not totally focused on that one, I'm going to hear about it. Because I'm going to be the first guy to critique myself. It's always funny when passengers say, hey, thanks, that was, I'm so glad you're concerned. Well, I tell you, you want, a, you want a pilot who's really not so much concerned about the passengers, he's concerned about himself. Because yeah. <laughs> the number one passenger on the flight is me. Yeah. You know, that's all I, I'm really I'm making sure I'm going home to see my family tonight and I'm going to do everything smart and I'm not going to cut any corners. I'm going to do everything just right. And oh, by the way, those people in the back, they're along for the ride. So I'm I've got that kind of, you know, attitude that every time I'm doing it, I'm focused on on what that project is right there, not focus on the next flight or whatever or the past one. So I think for us sometimes in life, uh, We've got to enjoy the now mm -hmm. and, and experience the now, but focus on the now. And do that with all the skills that Trevor talked about, whether it's training, whether it's education, uh, whatever. And, and the failures uh, are learning opportunities. Yeah, I think that the very, you touched on it, Roy, the most important part in achieving success is acknowledging right from the start you're going to have a whole bunch of failures on the way. And you you got to understand that that is not a problem, that everybody who's successful goes through that. The biggest reason most people don't succeed is they're scared to try because they're scared of failure. Mm. Well, we all fail. Every single one of us fails all the time. It is how you process that failure. Is it a learning experience? Did you get a bit better be, You know, doing it because you failed that time? You know, it is... It, it, there's nobody who's successful who hasn't had a whole bunch of failures on the way. But it's the ones who get up, pick themselves up, dust themselves up and say, yeah, I learned something from that. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do it a bit better next time. Acknowledge right from the start you are going to have failures and embrace that, learn from that, and, and understand that's, a, that's an integral part of ach achieving success. And people don't. If they first time knowing about Trevor, you also do a little bit of filmmaking too. Mm. <laughs> so where does it end? <laughs> yeah, look, well, these things I always, you know, when I uh, 
I was going to go to a fine arts school to do filmmaking, but I never. I, I qualified to go, but I didn't go. I got into other things. Mm-hmm. But so in my fifties, I come back to filmmaking. Mm-hmm. So it was another thing that was still in my, still in my background. So I've made four films now, and I'm just starting to work on a fifth. Mm-hmm. Though you know, one of them was ninety minutes long. I've done three shorter ones, twenty minutes, thirty minutes long, all of which have. have been very critically uh, appreciated, mm-hmm. not financially hugely successful, but still, um, still very much a- achieved what I wanted to achieve as far as messaging goes. And I'm um, I'm thinking the next one is going to be even better and more financially successful. And I'm learning, learning, learning as I go with that process as well. So um, yeah, so I've done. F- Lecture, speaking, lecturing, writing, filmmaking, and a um, little bit of fishing sometimes too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And quick question: I'm gonna have both of you guys answer. Yeah. What does success mean to you in your own words? Success means to me to um, to basically in my my goal is to increase liberty in this world, to increase the amount of choice that people have for myself, my family, and those around me, politically, the whole lot. My big thing is freedom, liberty. Not freedom from responsibility, freedom with responsibility. And success to me is articulating that to other people and inspiring other people to move along that path. And you are... I think, uh, for me, it has been truth. I think I'm a. My mission has been, particularly over the last few years, um, because I, we weren't in my military career. Uh, I didn't believe our military leaders and others were being, and, and civilian leaders, were being as truthful as they needed to be. And I knew I could live my life. I had been taught in a Christian family. To always tell the truth, always be honest. Even when the truth hurts, you've got to be able to speak the truth. Jesus says, you got to love people, but you've got to tell them the truth. Otherwise, you know, if you raised your kids just by loving them all the time and never told them the, the real facts of life, you know, they're going to run right over you. And that's what happens in the world if we're not speaking the truth. And so I got involved with nonprofits. Uh, for that reason, ones that were speaking the truth. Americans wanted to love the children of these fallen heroes who had been killed, but our country was not doing anything special for them. They were not reminding them once a year the price of freedom you've paid, you know, it is recognized by this country, and we need to say something. So that charity, Snowball Express, started doing that. But out of that experience... I learned the the sad truth that our own leaders had not been telling us the truth about you know a particular ideology, Islamic ideology, and I found and and I and in the course of that, God had me study everything about Islam I could, but it resulted in me coming closer to Christ because I had to learn about my own faith in a way that I had not studied it very closely. So in a strange kind of way, studying Islam made me a better Christian. And and that was the truthfulness of what the Bible speaks. It is universal. It is always there. It's not hypocritical. Um, it, but it can also sometimes be uh, uncomfortable to, to the point where speaking the truth, as we see with Christians around the world who are being persecuted, they're speaking the truth, and yet they're people's enemies. And so that was the burden that God put on me. You know, doing snowball was easy. I mean, everybody wants to help children of fallen heroes. But speaking the truth from a spiritual standpoint between Islam and Christianity, that conflict, <laughs> let's face it, our world is wrapped up in a lot of anger over those two topics. So I, I, I knew as an airline pilot, if I wanted to learn how to fly a plane, I had to study the manuals. So I went back to studying the manuals of not only my own faith, but of uh, Islamic faith. And that's when I began to say, you know, now I have this information. If I, if I don't say anything about it, I'm not completing the oath that I took 
to protect and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And merely because I retired, that oath doesn't go away. So to me, truth is is what we have to live our lives by. And, and Trevor's speaking the truth, and particularly as someone who's lived in a democ- you know, lived in a country that had that socialistic, almost communistic kind of flavor. Um, I think listening to what he has to say is a very telling, you know, forerunner of what what would happen if we lose our freedom. So it's and that's a, that's a sad truth too. We don't we don't appreciate it. We just don't appreciate it enough. And, and Trevor, yeah, like well, so add to that, you know, the truth can hurt for a while, but lies hurt forever. You know, you got to tell the truth, and because uh, if you lie to people to soften the blow or to whatever. You just fool them, and you just set them up for another problem later. You know, lies continue. Truth sets you on a new path. Sometimes it can be painful, yes, but telling lies is a lot more painful over the long term. And being truthful to yourself, because I think that's that's where in those people who are struggling and trying to find those keys in their life to make them, you know, they they say I'm really trying as hard as I can, but are you really? Are you really? Are you really exploring every opportunity? Are you going outside? Are you going outside your comfort zone? Are you doing other things, or searching out? Because sometimes we think it comes so easy because we look at what's on TV and it looks very easy, or we hear this or that. You know, why am I not getting those kind of results? And and really, sometimes the first place you got to look is look in that mirror. What what am I doing? Personal responsibility is a term you hear too often, but it can't be overemphasized. So, I mean, I look at you, what you've done. I mean, holy cow. Uh, you know, since we first met and seeing how this has blossomed for you, I mean, you didn't sit back and wait for the game to come to you. You, you said, I'm going to get up and do this stuff. Now, you had a support structure, great mom, business manager, Rico, sponsors, others. Holy cow. I mean, it, it takes a team, but... At the end of the day, Shemaya Reed's the man. Either you wake up every day and do it, or nobody's going to do it for you. Rico, same way. Nobody's going to open that door for Rico. He doesn't get up every morning, gets his ass out of bed, says, hey, I'm coming in here to do it. Yeah, you did build this. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Unlike what some people people say. And touch on this, because people listen to this show every week. I always try to bring different people from all backgrounds. Because this whole podcast idea is about everybody. Right. Each, every one of us have a story. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what you believe. That's right. You believe in ghosts. I don't care. It's about everyone's perspective with their voice. Because we, we each want to have a voice. So, Trevor, do you, uh, if you can do us a favor, touch on how has faith uh, in your world impact what you do and how you do things in life? Yeah, look, if I, if I believed this world was purely material, was just atoms bumping into atom, atoms, I'd say we're pretty well screwed. You know? <laughs> because the natural tendency of matter is to deteriorate, and you're always fighting, you know. Um, but because I believe there is this, the, the, the world is primarily spiritual, I understand that things like good and evil are there, that truth matters, that there are consequences for our actions, and if we are honest and 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 do what we believe is right, we are helped. We are, you know, the world goes better for us, not because the atoms are rearranged in the correct way, but because the world is primarily spiritual. And... You know, there is good and evil in the world, and good should be nourished, and evil should be banished. And if you're pursuing the right path, things will tend to fall into place for you. You'll meet the people you need to meet. Um, that You'll tend to make the right decisions, and things will just happen that shouldn't happen, but do happen. You know, we've all had coincidences in life that just are so far out of um, probability that are unreal. But if we're on the right path, these coincidences will happen more and more often. So I I, um, absolutely know that uh, we're not just a a collection of atoms. We're not just living in a world of mud. You know, we are living in a world ruled by spiritual Values, and the closer we come to those, the better it will go for us. And if you guys want to dabble into what you currently do today, 
Tell us, uh, Roy, starting with you, what some of the things you're involved with today? Well, I mean, I helped start a group called Truth and Textbooks. Uh, our mission is to, again, back to the word truth, is to go and help local communities or states. And in, in the state of Texas, for example, we organized to train approximately 50 volunteers to go out and review the upcoming or the social studies textbooks that were under consideration here in the state of Texas. Well, we trained everyone. I went out and did what I would normally do and go ask the experts and say, what's the best, what's the best way to put the, because I'm certainly didn't use a lot of textbooks when I was in school, so I was not the expert in that area, but we went out and found those, trained everyone, and then had a plan, put a plan in place that we changed, but we went forward with a plan, and then trained these people, and then reviewed the 32 social studies textbooks, and found over 1,500 errors in the social studies textbooks before the State Board of Education approved them. We got the State Board of Education to eliminate or correct over 60% of those errors. This was after the experts had looked at it, before the books became public. And so for those 50 people, 50 people changed what 5 million children in the state of Texas are going to use for the next 10 years. That is the power, and and that, that comes from volunteers, but it comes from the Holy Spirit who really... You know, was the motivator and really the you know the inspiration for this because, like you said, there were so many things pushing against us, and we were able to do that. And as a result of that, our phone started ringing off the hook, and now we're involved in Florida, California, New York, Connecticut, uh, Washington State. People, I fly all over the country speaking and and training people. We've trained nearly 200 reviewers around the country that are our kind of minute man who will respond to local communities when they need materials to eliminate the political correct themes that we're seeing. So, so much misinformation about our history, which is what Trevor, you know, and what he does is he brings the light of the reality to it. And, and we see our children being indoctrinated, uh, just like Trevor was talking about what was happening in New Zealand. We're, we've been seeing this for the last 30 years in the textbook. So we've been correcting those, and people can learn more about us by going to truthintextbooks.com. If they go to that website, they'll see the reviews of the textbooks that we've done. We're adding more, and we want local people to have something to look at to say, this is in my child's textbooks where they say MacArthur is a racist, where they say uh, communist or Cuba has great education system and a medical system, and that, yeah, it's a little, uh, you know, it's a little bad for someone, but over Overall, it's a good place to live. You know, those kinds of things that American exceptionalism where you don't even mention, you know, Neil Armstrong's landing on the moon as far as an American accomplishment. You don't even mention that. Why? Because you don't want to bring attention to any of the things that America's known for. When all you talk about in World War II is Japanese internment camps and the dropping of the atom bomb, but you talk nothing about the heroism of men and women who were there uh, and, and minorities and others, all you're doing is talking about all the negatives. So we found that in doing this, people who would never be interested, but they are interested in the truth, are coming out and hearing what's going on and also how they depict Christianity, Islam, Israel, uh, all of these types of topics that, you know, this is over a course of the last 30 years. So we've been doing that and, and we're excited about about how the success we're having around the country. It's it's a slow process, but uh, nothing nothing uh, good happens quickly usually, and, and we're doing that. So we're I'm proud to be able to train the volunteer using other people. So I'm just kind of the manipulator. I get all the accolades, all the all the stuff, but it's really the volunteers that are that are doing that. So um, I, I'm very blessed and happy to be doing that. So again, Truth in Textbooks, and if you're interested in becoming a reviewer or learning more about, they can write to us at TNT dot textbooks at gmail.com and uh, and then briefly we ha- I have a group called G416 Patriots this is why Tra- Trevor's in town he's here to speak to us if you want more information we talk about the spiritual battle that's going on between Islam and Christianity and talking honestly about that and uh, I support some nonprofit groups that are witnessing to Muslims about the love of Jesus Christ and we think that's that's really what's going to turn this battle around from terrorism and a lot of the things that we're living with is doing that but telling the truth so we're thankful for Trevor being in town and he's speaking tomorrow night 
uh, or tonight, actually, tonight at uh, Village Parkway Baptist Church. But he'll be in Bernie, Texas on Tuesday night or Tuesday at lunchtime, 1130 at the Kronsky Center uh, there in Bernie, Texas at 1130 on next Tuesday. So if you want to hear Trevor, come on out and we're glad to have him in town. So, And I'm going to ask both of you guys this question. I'll start with Trevor. Uh, what does faith mean to you? Because obviously some topics like Islam and Christianity is a very hot and sensitive topic. So what does faith mean to you? And and just talk a little bit more about personally your walk with Christ. Yeah, well, you know, faith means to me not just blind belief. I think there's such a thing as informed faith. You have to educate yourself And you don't just believe because you want to believe. You actually have to look into things. You have to study texts. You have to understand what you want to believe in. And you have to make comparisons. You know, um, we're commanded to go into this world. We're sent into this world as as sheep among wolves. We're commanded to be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Mm -hmm. So that means we have to be innocent and trusting, but also discerning. Mm-hmm. And and wise about the decisions we make. We don't just believe anybody that comes along and tells us a story. We have to do some due diligence ourselves. You have to study the texts. You have to you have to be logical about this. But ultimately, yes, you have to make a decision to believe. But it shouldn't be blind just because daddy told me or mommy told me or my friend told me. Faith will only last the test of time as if you have come to it yourself. If you have come to it through your own decisions and your own discovery and your own dis- and, and you've made that choice yourself. Um, so, yeah, um, as Roy says, you've got to discover the truth, but there is, you've got to use your rational faculties as part of that process. And you want to add something to that? Yeah, faith in works. Um, I, I found myself just kind of going through life, um, just being a, quote, I thought what was a good Christian, uh, tithing, you know, raising a family. But it wasn't until I got involved with, with uh, nonprofits that I really realized uh, the essence of what Jesus Christ talks about in reaching out and helping those who are less fortunate, uh, taking your talents and doing something with it instead of just you know going out and playing golf four times a day, you know, you know four times a week or whatever. You know, airline pilots are notorious for whatever the case may be. But for me, it was stepping out and then. Once I was taking those actions, seeing how many things came back my way that was blessing me far more than what I was giving out. And whether it was with Snowball Express or, you know, talking to people about Islam and and knowing and saying to Christians, we should not be fearing Muslims. This is not something we should be loving Muslims. You know, Christ gives us this edict to go into all the worlds. Well, let me tell you, Christian organizations, and which I've supported and funded for years, have not gone into Muslim countries because of the danger in the world. Well, we have Muslims in our community right now that we work with, we interact with. We need to have relationships with them. We need to have, you know, honest relationships with them, but be open and understanding and loving to them because the number one reason why Muslims say that they leave the faith is because they've met a Christian that breaks the stereotype of what they have been taught a Christian is like. Mm -hmm. And stepping outside the box and engaging with them on a one-on-one basis and having a personal relationship with them and family and engaging with them at work, at school, or, or in neighborhood, inviting them over and learning about their culture, but knowing firmly in your faith that you worship a different God than they do, but presenting it to them in a way that is through your example lets them know that you love them and that's the key difference between you know the Islamic religion that's taught by Muhammad versus and there are many great loving Muslims and I have lots of friends who you know 
don't know much about the Quran, but they know what they believe about Islam. Mm-hmm. Just like I know lots of Christians who call themselves Christians and say, oh, I'm a Christian, yet go off and yeah. do some pretty bizarre kind of behavior. Mm-hmm. So it, it is having that faith, and, and, and I've seen it work in so many different ways, that, and, I'm, and I'm working with groups that are even better at it than I am, that are seeing the success. The number this is what's kind of shocking. More people have, more Muslims have come to Christ probably in the last seven, you know, since the turn of the 20, 21st century, in, since the 80s, let's say, than in the previous 1,400 years. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is the Internet. God has given us the Internet to reach into the lives of Muslims around the world to let them know the love of Jesus Christ and the honesty about what's going on with Islam and doing it in a way that is changing their lives and giving them the truth about Jesus Christ. Not the truth as it's depicted within, you know, the Quran or others, but doing it within the, the concept of, of telling speaking the truth about our Savior Lord Jesus Christ. So I think that that is encouraged. We were talking about it on the drive. I'm more encouraged now than ever before after uh, being engaged in this battle that the, the challenge will be won. But it won't come without some ups and downs. And uh, we just have to continue as Christians to, to use love, but use truth. That's why we chose Galatians 4.16 as our group. Paul went back to the Galatians telling them about how to become a Christian. And the Jews were very upset that they were having that anyone could be a Christian, not just Jews, and they thought it could only be. And so he, he, Paul said to him, says, I'm now your enemy for telling you the truth. So Galatians says that, and then when we tell people the truth, sometimes we're your enemy. Well, that's not on me, that's on you. The truth is the truth. And the truth of Jesus Christ is he loves everyone. And that's, but you've got to come to him. You've got to accept that. He's not going to force it on you. It's not a socialistic religion, which is a good thing. So that's that's how faith is and uh, has worked in my life, and I'm I'm blessed because of it. So I'm I'm very thankful and thankful we met to yes. again Lance Hoppus, who uh, you know heard me speak and said I'm God wants me to have two more hours of radio time and gave us an hour of that, and that, you're the producer for that show. So you know, and here we are today. So and Trevor never knew Trevor until. Two years ago, and then boom. I met him yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and there you go. So there's a reason why all this happens. And Trevor, you know, in your writings, and in your speech, and in your films, if you can boil it down to one message for the audience, what would that message that you want them to obtain? Yeah, yeah well, most of what I, I write about is, um, see, when, when people take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States... It's against enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, we all understand there are foreign enemies of this country, say North Korea or Iran or whatever, you know, the governments of those countries, not the people. But very few of us understand that there are people in this country, in government and very high positions of power, who want to do us harm. We have to understand that not everybody has good intentions. And part of, part of um, being an honest citizen is to understand that there are internal enemies. So my work points this out, and it really is a message for, for, for tighter security um, in government positions and at greater diligence of our public officials. Even in this city here, you know, the Communist Party of San Antonio was run out of a barber shop on the south side, you know, back in the <laughs> 30s and 40s and 50s. And this, the influence of that organisation is still felt today in your city council and your congressional representatives and that you are electing people that want to do this country harm, that want to bring the constitution down. So so um, that's really the focus of most of my writings. And if people want to see a great movie, and I'll push it myself, look, go on the internet and look for the enemieswithinmovie.com. Enemieswithinmovie.com. We say there's 100 congressmen and 20 senators who are basically disloyal to the Constitution, who are working for Cuba or China or enemies of this country, but they're serving in your Congress right now, and that is the cause of a lot of the problems that America has. And that's shocking mm-hmm. to a lot of people who are listening to this podcast. Oh, that's over. Mm-hmm. Honestly, go and take a look at enemiesfromwithin.com and look at that 
and judge for yourself. And there's another website you have. They can, what's the website you have that will, they can Google yeah. up San Antonio? Yeah. And see. Well, Key, Key Wiki. I've got a big website called Key Wiki. Uh, K E Y W I K I. And it's got over 104,000 profiles of American radicals, um, you know, just enemies of people who, who want to destroy the country. And if you look at San, this, you, you, you can look at um, some of your congressmen from San Antonio, you can look at some of your city councillors, you can look at these are people who are allied with very radical movements like the Communist Party, like La Raza, like CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations which is a front for the terrorist Muslim Brotherhood. But these are people operating in your communities right now. And that is why they are forcing their education policies down your throat, their health care policies. They are trashing America every chance they get. They are fighting against the Constitution. And then go to your website too. At Tre- yeah, my daily blog is trevorloudon.com. Loudon is L-O-U-D-O-N. Trevorloudon.com. So we have a series of articles there. Exposing some of these people. That's not all I do, but the main focus of my work is exposing the enemies within because I see this as the greatest, freest country in the world. And if America is ever destroyed, it'll drag every other free, loving, freedom loving country down with it. Mm. Nobody can survive if America isn't there to lead the way. And I, I think that's, you know, that's in essence the message. Here we have someone from New Zealand coming to America to warn us of what they're seeing. And, and when you have millennials eight, or 18 to 29 years of age who, when their survey was asked, what do you think is better, socialism or democracy? And they vote for socialism. Trevor grew up in that kind of environment. And, and, and the reason why they believe that is because our textbooks, back to what we were doing, yeah. you know, has taught the children, hey, all the pluses of socialism and communism, and, and yet they don't use so- communism. Oftentimes it's code worded for socialism. And yet that's exactly what's going to lead us down. Path. Yeah. Well, the, the enemies of America have long understood they needed to penetrate the educational system here to, to make American, young American kids hate their own country. And there's a lot of American kids now who think America got rich because it ripped off the third world and exploited people and is a horrible history of slavery and, 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 and corruption. Well, yeah, the, every country has its bad elements, but America has been the most benevolent country the world has ever seen, the most generous country, the freest country, the most prosperous country. It's a guiding light for everyone who loves liberty. So, yes, we should confront the dark, the dark periods of, of, of history. We've got to be honest, as, as Roy says. We've got to tell the truth. But just focusing only on the negative aspects of America, as most history textbooks do now, is not doing kids a service. They've got to understand the greatness of America, how America saved the world in World War II, how the American Constitution is the greatest political document ever written, because... It is the first country in the world that said rights come from, your human rights come from God directly to the people. And the people then elect representatives to protect those rights. Every society before that, the rights came from God to the king and the king made all the decisions. The king interpreted the way that would suit him or her. And and so America is such an exceptional country. It's a beacon of liberty for everybody. So Roy is reestablishing the truth in the textbook so American kids understand the greatness of their country. And I'm working on exposing some of the enemies of the country so we can clean them out of office and get more patriotic people into, into leadership positions. And back to what Ro was saying earlier about telling the truth, the easiest way to have a problem is if you speak up, right? That's right. I mean, that can happen in any... Yeah, in a workplace, in school, at church, you know, at home. You know, you see your friends. You know, how many kids uh, that you know of, if someone who knew what was right and wrong had simply said to that person who was at that fork and around, hey, I don't think, let's go, let's come over here. Let's don't go there. Let's don't do that. But because of people's unwillingness to stand up and be bold or to speak the truth, truth that they know because they're worried about losing a friend or hurting someone's feelings, 
that's that's the demise of our nation. You know, people who, but when people start standing up and being, you know, calling it out, Jesus Christ, you know, stood up and told the truth and was persecuted. We have Coptic Christians around the world that are doing the same thing and, and politicians who speak the truth. And uh, they're oftentimes labeled as haters or, you know, and, and the other sides love to kind of put that on us. So we're just... Uh, we're going to continue to do it and because that's what God wants us to do. And, and uh, speaking the truth is the ultimate act of love. Yeah. And it, sometimes it may be painful, but you look at uh, one little example. You know, we saw the, the, the scandal in Flint, Michigan, where lead poisoning affected thousands of people, young kids, and people in the city government knew it was going on but didn't say anything. Well, this Me well, Too that, movement, the well, Me Too movement, yeah. another example, clearly. Yeah. Well, if you know know something's wrong and you don't say anything are you any better than the person who's actually doing it yeah that's true i can tell you looking at miss reed over there she was telling the truth to you growing up <laughs> she told you a lot of truth and sometimes it wasn't didn't make you happy but that's just the nature uh, you know of what life is of, of discerning and, and i love that word that trevor used discerning knowing the discernment mm-hmm. of what is right and wrong and i think we know that um, we just have to have the courage to speak up and, and do that. So, and, and what you're doing with your podcast, you know, again, uh, sharing that truth with people, the success stories, uh, it is a wonderful thing. So, God's got you on a great mission, Shemai. And think, think about this podcast because I purposely want you guys to be on the show today just to have a diverse perspective, mm-hmm. a different viewpoint. And the whole. If you just tie up, if you listen to the whole show over again, and you listen to Roy's childhood story, and you listen to Trevor's childhood story, the bottom line is this platform is everyone has a story. Yeah. But if only pick and choose who can tell their story, then what's the point? That's right. So I appreciate you guys coming in today, tell the truth. (laughs) But not just tell the truth, but really just talk about your life. Because I think a lot of times people are, are so rushing to judgment versus just listen. Oh, yeah. That's why we have two ears and one mouth. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's a good point. Good point. So with wrapping up this podcast, because time always goes by fast, yeah. what's some of the last encouraging words you just like to tell people in general? Well, I think there's a lot of hope out there. I think we live in a world that uh, wants you to think there is no hope. But that hope comes from Jesus Christ. Uh, because if we wrap ourselves up in whatever the, the latest fad politician, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Romney, whether it's Obama, Clinton, whoever you're, you're siding with, you know, all of those people are going to fail you. I'm telling you, all of them are going to fail you. And the one steady constant in all of this that will never fail me is Jesus Christ. And I always go back to that root and say, am I doing his work and telling the truth in a loving way and and making sure that I'm giving him the glory? I love that when the Eagles, the coach and the quarterback, you know, all stood up and said, and people, oh, that's so hokey. It's not hokey. What you're doing is because of Jesus Christ. What the, the work you've done, the, the fact that your your parents have supported you in the way they have, you know, that's that's the message, and and that's the hope of the world. It's not it's not anything else out there. It's not material things like Trevor said. It, it's that, and and getting back to those roots is what's going to save our country, and uh, and we're not going to have to, you know, rely on anything else. So I, I'm just I. I'm so glad we've we've struck up a great friendship, and thanks for having us on today. Thank you, Trevor. Trevor? I want to say, everybody out there listening, you were created for a reason. You are a unique individual. You have gifts and talents, and you are expected to use them to your maximum ability for your family, for yourself, and to help others achieve their responsibilities. You weren't given a mind for nothing. You weren't given a pair of hands for nothing. You were given them for a reason. And you are a unique person um, who is loved by God. And you are expected and desired to achieve the maximum you can with your life. And I think you need to, everybody needs to understand the importance of of their role in 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 this world. And there you guys have it. 
This was an awesome show. Make sure you just listen to this again and share it with your friends and family. I do not want to close the show uh, without thanking the main guy, the main man since day one, Rico Rodriguez with Rockefeller's Barbershop. And also shout out to uh, Baby McClinton, All Sports Speed and Conditioning, and the best donuts in San Antonio, Miss Kim with River City <laughs> Donuts. Absolutely. You guys and ladies, like I always say, keep God first. God bless. In peace.